Hello and good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to the Leeds Business Power Breakfast. My name is Laurel Harmon, and I'm the Assistant Director of Events at the Leeds School of Business. We're fortunate to be part of such a vibrant, thriving community, especially in such a unprecedented times. As the nation's 10th most prolific public research university, CU is a well-established and respected leader in innovation, developing solutions for many of today's major societal changes, including significant contributions to Colorado's fight against the coronavirus. Leeds plays a role in advancing the university's innovative work, inspiring and educating tomorrow's business leaders and contributing to the dynamic business community around us. Innovation also shows up in our research and in the classroom. Leeds distinguished faculty are top academic leaders from around the globe who are committed to creating both impactful knowledge and groundbreaking business research. In fact, our faculty ranked 24th in the world per capita research productivity by the University of Texas, Dallas, bracketed by Darth Dartmouth Tuck School of Business and UCLA's Anderson School of Management. In their instruction, our faculty are consistently innovative in our curriculum and students engagement, as you will observe today. Additionally, our undergraduate business program ranked number 20 in US News and World reports, top public undergraduate business schools, and our full-time MBA program is ranked number 15 for entrepreneurship. This is to say that Leeds continues to focus on positively shaping the future of business by educating and inspiring the next generation of business leaders, of which you are all a part of. The Leeds community of more than 42,000 around the world is a community that will always be there, no matter where you roam. We hope you will continue to find the Leeds School and your classmates a source of inspiration and connection far into the future. I hope you enjoy the event and thank you again for joining us. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Please keep yourself on mute to eliminate any background noise. Um, I will be monitoring the chat function at the bottom of your screen, so please submit any questions you may have throughout the presentation for us to address with Rico at the end. If you experience any technical difficulties during the event, please notify me through the chat function as well so I can work um, to get you back online. And then after Rico's presentation and Q&A this morning, he will stay online till about 9.30 for optional networking. If you are interested in networking and with fellow attendees or Rico, please stay on the call following the conclusion of Q&A. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Rico Bambaca. Rico Bambaca is an assistant professor of marketing at the Leeds School of Business. He received his PhD in marketing from the Paul Mirage School of Business at the University of California, Irvine. He earned BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Toronto and MBA from the Sloan School of Management at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and an MS in operations research from Virginia Tech. Rico's research interests are in the development and application of big data methods in marketing with a focus on um, but, sorry, Bazin, um hierarchy models, target marketing loyalty programs, distributed Markovi chain Monte Carlo methods, non-paramedic methods, structural e echo metrics, and scientific visualization. Rico has extensive marketing, business development, and sales industry experience both domestically and internationally working with technology startups in the San Francisco Bay Area. Rico teaches marketing, research, and analytics in the undergraduate program and data and decision in the MBA program. Welcome, Rico, and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, uh, Laurel, for the very kind uh, introduction. It's a pleasure and honor for me to be uh, talking to you uh, this morning uh, about my research. It's something I'm very passionate about and uh, absolutely love. Um, today's topic um, is called Scalable Target Marketing with Big Data. It's actually um, the research that I developed for my PhD dissertation. Um, 
And I've done it, I did the work alongside Sanjog Misra and Peter Rossi. They were my advisors um, at the time. Sanjog is currently at the University of Chicago and Peter is at, the, uh, uh, at UCLA, University of California in uh, Los Angeles. Um, what I thought I would do is in terms of an agenda, oops, if I can get my slide thing to work here. Hmm. Huh. Okay, let's, oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, great. Well, okay, let me go back. Sorry. Okay, there we are. Okay. I was using my keys. I should have been using my mouse here. Okay, good. So what I thought we'd do uh, in terms of an agenda is um, introduce the topic from a business perspective. So what is the business opportunity? And once we've addressed that or I defined it, uh, talk about the approach we're taking. Uh, the theory behind the approach in terms of its rigor, and then we'll see if it actually works. The method we're using will demonstrate um, its applicability with simulated data, and then we'll actually look at a real case study with um, real world uh, case situation and real, real data, and we'll conclude. And then if time permits, we'll, I'll talk a bit about what I'm currently working on. Okay. Okay, so before we go into too much into detail on the, on the business opportunity, I wanted to talk about what I mean by target marketing. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's just as simple as getting the right message to the right person at the right time and place. Sounds simple enough. Examples would be, you know, if you're browsing online, uh, you may have an opportunity as a business to show an online advertisement. Um, what is the right advertisement to show to that person at the right time, place and time? Uh, what price do you want to charge for a particular product or what promotion you may want to offer to, uh, to a particular individual. The opportunity we have in the business world these last, I guess it started, I guess, 10 plus years ago, um, data is being collected by business organizations at an unprecedented rate. Um, and in particular, they're collecting almost every aspect of a consumer's behavior. Um, and you can envision that online particularly. And how, at, at what rate? Um, currently, we're, we've got about the total amount of global data that's associated with customer data is at around, uh, let's see here, about 60 zettabytes. How, how big is a zettabyte? It's actually a one with 21 zeros. So that's a, that's a lot of data that's, that we currently have available. And the amount that we're actually continuing to collect is actually accelerating at, an, at a higher rate. Um, so it's unprecedented in terms of how much data is being collected. And you may or may not, although you, most of you probably realize, you know, every click that you're clicking online is being recorded, assuming you're allowing cookies on your, uh, on your browser. So for example, if you're shopping um, with Amazon, you know, Walmart, Macy's, what have you, um, everything's being recorded. What, what page you're visiting, um, what, you know, what click for more information you're clicking on, whether you're putting something into your cart and then abandoning the cart and then perhaps later coming on, uh, come by, coming back to make that purchase, all of that transaction history is actually being recorded. Um, and the same goes on for other, other, other uh, categories. Uh, movies, you know, Netflix, Disney, Apple, music, Spotify, Pandora. Uh, for, for those of you that have hobbies, you're probably very familiar with Etsy or Pinterest. Um, social media, of course, Meta, formerly Facebook. Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, for those athletes among us. Uh, if you're a hardcore runner or, or, or cyclist, uh, you're, you're probably a member, you may be a member of Strava to actually record all of your uh, exploits in, in, uh, as a runner, for example. If you're a hiker, uh, you might be subscribing to all trails. Um, every interaction, you're, you're, um, uh, you're Everything you're in, every detail of that interaction is being recorded. And finally, product experiences, right? Tesla, they're trying to get out full self-driving mode. Uh, well, you bet you they're recording every, mo every interaction when you're driving that vehicle for purposes of understanding uh, typical driver behaviors and of course, improving the full self-driving capability itself. Electronic Arts, if you're a gamer, is actually looking at the games you choose, who you're teaming up with when you play those games, what kind of strategies you're using to, to play those games. All of that is very useful uh, information for enhancing uh, uh, experiences and improving products over time. 
So that's, that's what's going on, been going on for 10 plus years now. Um, the insight that I had, um, and it's not so much of an insight, I'd say, but really just putting the two together. How can we take advantage of target, mar of, I'm sorry, of, of big data to do target marketing very, very precisely? Um, the idea being, if we've got so much data out there, we probably have the potential to understand customers' preferences very, very precisely um, at an with an unprecedented level of accuracy, actually. Um, and if we are able to, in fact, extract in, in deep insights about consumer behavior uh, with all of that data, we should be able to target them very effectively. And, and why is that important? Well, it's a win-win. If we're able to target consumers very precisely, um, we can we can um, customize our messages so that when the, the messages that they do receive from us are spot on, right? They're not gonna receive messages or promotions or what have you that don't necessarily fit their needs. Um, but when they do get a message, it's gonna be spot on in terms of what they're looking for and therefore more, more likely to, to, to do that click and hopefully make that purchase. Um, it's a win for businesses because with their limited marketing budgets, they're able to really rifle shot, if you will, um, their, their, uh, their messages to their customers. They're not, kind of, they're not like doing this shotgun approach of just spraying random messages to a broad audience. They're very specific in, in, in how they go after uh, their customers. So that's what I mean by target marketing, really taking advantage of that large data to develop deep insights for purposes of getting the right message to the right customer at the right time and place. Okay, but there's a problem. And the problem is that regular computers um, don't scale to the size of modern data sets um, because we've got this humongous amount of data um, that needs to be processed to get those deep insights. Um, these regular computers just aren't fast enough. They don't have enough memory and they don't have, don't have enough storage. So that's a problem we need to deal with. Well, we have something called supercomputers. And what is a supercomputer? A supercomputer is simply a collection or a cluster is the term they use. It's just a cluster of thousands of regular computers that communicate very quickly among themselves. And most of you have probably um, seen, been in a data center, or been exposed to a data center. Well, a data center is really a supercomputer. Um, and if you walk into one, it just looks like, uh, you know, an academic library. We've got stacks and stacks and stacks. Instead of books, there's are stacks of computers. Um, and again, there's thousands of these things. And every large research institution has one. So CU, uh, uh, CU Boulder has one, of course. Um, uh, but what about businesses? Well, businesses, large research businesses also have, have their own, but most do not. Um, is that a problem? It's actually not because we have, we have a, a number of large IT services organizations that have very profitable, very fast growing uh, businesses around renting time on their supercomputers. Um, so for example, Amazon, I think last I checked, Amazon's fastest growing business and most profitable business is their Amazon web services division. And that's what they do. They have these huge data center and what they do is they rent out time on, uh, from their data center. Google has one, Microsoft has one, IBM has, has one, and it's a growing, growing number of organizations that are making, and it's very, and it's very profitable uh, for them. And you might imagine that, whoa, this is gonna be expensive. Actually, it's not. Um, the way you uh, rent time on these computers, you would log in remotely um, from, uh, from your console on, on your home computer, for example, and uh, you would then submit the job, um, the day, and upload the data for that job uh, remotely, again, from your home or, or your office. And uh, you would run, uh, you would request time on the computer. And uh, that time, it would be billed at a rate of literally cents per CPU hour. So for example, if you just use one computer for one hour, it'll cost you pennies. Um, um, and of course, at that rate, um, it's, and I'll share uh, cost data later on when we're actually running these larger models in terms of what it costs you. You know, with, uh, with a budget of literally hundreds of dollars, literally $100 or $200, you can do massive computations on these things um, 
over extended periods of time. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll drop into specific numbers when we go through the examples later on. Okay, um, so that's what a supercomputer is. Um, but there's a bot, there's always a bot, right? So what's the bot? The bot is um, uh, traditional statistical methods that are used today to infer consumer behaviors from data, their preferences, don't run on supercomputers. They're not designed to run on supercomputers. They're only designed to run on a single processor computer like your desktop. So that's a problem. Uh, so what's, what, what's the answer? You're, the answer myself and, and my authors decided to take is, well, why don't we use a supercomputer to distribute the processing of all of this data across uh, across all of these computers within the supercomputer, right? Supercomputer consists of thousands of regular computers. When we distribute the processing across these thousands of computers in a special way, okay? And so what I mean by special way is read the topic of this presentation. I'll be presenting a new method, statistical method that um, breaks up the data, this massive amount of data into smaller chunks distributes those chunks to each regular computer in this supercomputer. Each of these regular computers on the supercomputer processes the, their chunk of data independently and separately. And then we combine it all together in a special way to get those customer preferences and insights. So that's really the focus of today's presentation. Okay. Um, now we're gonna dive a little bit more um, into the kind of method that we're gonna use. Um, and this is, uh, and, and we'll talk a bit about uh, what I mean by Bayesian hierarchical models. There's a mouthful there, but it's actually quite straightforward when we, when we break it down. Okay, but to, to, to introduce the idea, we first need to recognize that, uh, as I said earlier, big data provides us with lots and lots of information uh, about consumer behaviors for many customers. However, for any one customer, and you can think of yourself, for example, you may only observe a small number of, of, of behaviors that, that are of interest to a particular business. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, let's go to an example of shoe purchases. And you may think of yourself again, you say, okay, well, it turns out that the typical consumer may only purchase several pairs of shoes each year. And I'm being generous here when I say five to 10, I'll buy only one to two. Um, but let's say um, worst case, you know, or best case, I should say, you're buying five to 10 pairs of shoes each year, which sounds a lot, um, but let's just go with that. Now you need to think about, and you wanna infer a consumer's preferences for their shoes, but you need to recognize that shoe preferences could vary by type of shoe. For example, the shoes you might work, use for work, for home, um, uh, sports, um, you know, running, biking, whatever it might be, tennis, casual, everyday, uh, formal, if you're going out to dinner or, or, or to an opera, um, you may have different preferences for the type of shoes you'd bring, you'd, you'd purchase. In addition to that, within any one genre of, of, of shoe, you've got all these different attributes. And depending on the genre of shoe, so whether it's a work shoe or a casual shoe, your preferences may vary depending on the brand, the style, the quality, materials, color, price, what have you, okay? And so you can quickly realize that five to 10 purchases of shoes that I'm observing from you over the last year or two just isn't enough to estimate your preferences to get a really good idea on your preferences for shoe types across, but, uh, for shoes across types and attributes. To get a really precise estimate of your preferences, we'd really like to see ideally thousands of shoe purchases by you. And if clearly you're not buying that many shoes. And how do we address that issue? Um, and that's where this idea of, of a Bayesian hierarchical model comes in. And the way Bayesian hierarchical models solve this problem is by sharing data among consumers with similar preferences. Okay, so you can imagine that if there's a, you, if you had a twin with identical preferences as you somewhere else in the world, and they're also buying the same types of, have the same, same preferences as you, then if I could team your, couple your data with their data, now instead of five to 10 uh, shoe per transactions, I've got 10 to 20. 
and I can do um, inference more, more accurately. Um, um, so let's go through an example. Let's assume that your preferences for shoes, shoe types and attributes are very, very unique. How unique? Let's say you're one in a million, right? So every 1 million people in the world um, you're the only one that has this particular, these particular types of preferences. Okay? And let's say you're buying five shoes a year, which is being generous, I would think. Well, how much data do we need in order to collect the amount of data that would be provide insights, deep insights about your specific preferences? Well, if we have a data set of 10,000 consumers over, over a few years, and you're one in a million in terms of your preferences, only one out of 100 of those consumers are gonna have similar shoe purchases as you. In other words, a data set of 10,000 is gonna have 0 0.05 similar purchases. So at best, one purchase. If you scale up the data set to 100,000 consumers, one out of 10 consumers are gonna be similar to you. Half a purchase is gonna be this, um, is going to express your preferences. A million consumers, you're one in a million. So, so chances are there's gonna be in the, with a data set of a million consumer transactions, a million consumers and all of their transactions, there's gonna be one, buddy, one, one person similar to you. And so you've got another five, five similar purchases that we can add to your five purchases to do inference uh, and get a better sense for your preferences. 10 million, you've got 10 similar customers, you've got 50 purchases, 100 million, now we're getting somewhere. You've got 100 consumers that are similar to you that we can now use together about 500 purchases, all representing a, a preference that is similar to, to yours. Um, and with 500 purchases, we can very easily estimate your particular preferences very, very precisely. That's what a Bayesian hierarchical model does. But it's dependent, its success is dependent on big data. You need lots and lots and lots of big data. Now, clearly, if you're not one in a million, um, you're one in 100,000 or one in 10,000, then clearly we don't need as big a data set. But the more data, the better our, our, uh, the inference is going to be, the more accurate your, efforts, your um, estimates are going to be. So how do you estimate a Bayesian hierarchical model? It's done in, in two steps. The first step is by estimating what we call the distribution of preferences for all the consumers in the data set. So for example, you've got your million consumers, you've got, you, you, you put them all together in one big database. You don't label you know, any particular purchase as belonging to one consumer or not. You look at them all together and you just look at the distribution, how, pre how preferences are distributed, right? A certain number of people like this particular brand for this particular type of shoe of this particular quality at this particular price, this particular style, this particular color, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you got millions or hundreds of millions of these things, you have a very precise estimate of how preferences vary across the entire uh, population of data that you've got. And that's what we mean by the distribution of preferences. How are those preferences distributed um, by shoe type by attrib and, and, and attributes? Okay. And once we have that, we then use that distribution of preferences to and your specific purchases, you know, your five transactions of purchases, to figure out where you are, where do you fit in that broad distribution? And surprisingly, we just need a few purchases, right? Five, 10, 15 uh, uh, purchases are sufficient for us to identify where you are in this very precise distribution that we created earlier. And uh, enough for us to be able to uh, get a very precise estimate of your unique preferences. So that's broadly how models are estimated with a Bayesian hierarchical model. Why is it called a hierarchical model? Because there's a hierarchy, right? At the top of the hierarchy, you have that population distribution of preferences that you're estimating. Um, um, and from that, you're coupling your unique data, so customer A's unique data, to um, to identify that, per that person's uh, unique preferences. Okay, so how do we um, estimate uh, a model uh, with a Bayesian hierarchical model? It's done in two stages, right? Uh, stage one, um, and how do we do it on a cluster on a supercomputer? Stage one, 
uh, as the first stage, we estimate the population distribution, the population distribution of preferences. And then stage two, we, we estimate the unique preferences for each consumer. So it's two components. And when we do this on a supercomputer, because we said we can't do it on a regular computer, um, we can break up each stage into chunks. And I'll talk specifically about this. And each chunk is, is estimated in parallel. And by parallel, I mean each chunk is, is allocated to uh, a, a regular computer among the thousands in a supercomputer, and they're processing their chunk of data at the same time. So let's, let's actually go through um, uh, a, set of, uh, a set of slides that actually walk us through that. Okay. So in this slide, we have the capital letter Y. It represents all of the data. So all of the data associated with all of, the, all of your consumers that are purchasing shoes, for example. Okay. What you're buying, when you're buying it, where you bought it, what the price is, what the style, what the color is, all of that is, is represented by Y. We then split all of that data into chunks, right? Uh, I'm gonna say S chunks, where S is the number of computers that you're gonna allocate the data to. Um, so it could be 10 chunks, 100 chunks, 1,000 chunks. Um, and so you break that data into different chunks and you then um, communicate each of those chunks, each chunk to a separate regular computer as part of that supercomputer. You then run an algorithm. You're going to run a Bayesian hierarchical algorithm to estimate the subpopulation distribution of preferences. Okay, so instead of doing the, dis the distribution of preferences for everybody together, we're only going to do it for everybody in that particular chunk of data for that particular computer. And so we're going to have 10 chunks of data, let's say, or 100 chunks of data. We're going to have 100 population distributions of preferences that were estimated. But that's not what we want. We want the population distribution of preferences for the entire data set that we have, not the separate hundred chunks. So what we then do is we combine these 100 population distributions of preferences in a special way to come up with an estimate of the distribution of preferences for all of the data together. Okay, uh, that's the first stage. Uh, once we have the population distribution of preferences for all of the data, we then uh, communicate that to each of these 100 computers, which already has their chunk of data. And with together, we can then estimate very, very precisely and very quickly the consumer preferences for each individual that is in that chunk. So if you, have a, if you have 100 people in chunk one, it'll estimate the preferences for each of those 100 people. And that's it, okay, that's, that's the approach we're taking. It's as, it's as simple as that. Um, now, what's the theory, right? This, the, the, the method is, works, it's very fast, but is it accurate? Well, uh, we have one theory, and, and, and I promised uh, to Laurel I'm not gonna have any, theorem, any mathematical equations here. So I'm expressing our theorem uh, verbally. It's a, there's, a math, there's a series of mathematical theorems. This is the culminating theorem in the paper, the research paper. And the theorem states, at a theoretical, statistical theoretical level, the proposed algorithm that we, that we just described earlier, that runs on a supercomputer, estimate their, its, its estimates of a consumer's preferences are the same as you would get if you ran the traditional old method on a regular computer, regular single computer. Of course, it's not possible, but if it was possible, you'd get the same answer. But of course, you'd get that answer in a fraction of the time. So it's a rigorous result, but it's a theoretical result. Um, can we actually demonstrate the method? Of course we can. And we're gonna demonstrate it in two ways. We're gonna first show it, how it works, with simulated data. And what do I mean by simulated data? We're gonna make up data. Okay. And the reason we wanna make up the data is because we know the preferences, the true preferences that people have. And therefore we can see if the method will, will actually extract the, the true preferences that we use to generate the data. And then we're also gonna show it with a, uh, with a real case, uh, with real data. Okay, so I'm jumping ahead. This is um, the first chart of our stage one. And in the simulated data, 
We're actually simulating data for um, preferences that people have across four different, um, four different products uh, types. And we're looking at uh, four preferences, um, you know, preference for let's say brand one, brand two, brand three, um, and let's say how important price is. Okay, that could be another preference. How important is price to your uh, algorithm? In this case, I'm only gonna show the distribution of preferences, the population distribution of preferences for two elements of those preferences. I'm gonna call them uh, preference element three and element four, or attribute three or out attribute four, whatever they might be. The true value of, L of attribute three in the, in the data we've generated is actually three, the number three. The true uh, preference uh, level uh, for attribute four is the number two, and that's on average. Okay. And so what do we see in these charts, or these plots, I should say? Okay, we're actually superimposing three types of plots. The first being in blue, and it's hard to see the blue because it's being covered by the, by the red, but if you can look closely, you'll see there's a blue line in each of those. That blue line represents what I call truth. It's the true population distribution of preferences um, uh, that, is, um, uh, that is estimated, that is inferred from a, the, the, the traditional statistical process using a single regular computer, okay? So that's truth, that's what the, that's the regular computer with the traditional method gives you. In gray, we've got uh, a bunch of those. Um, those are each the population of preferences for each chunk of data that we ran on the supercomputer. And so you see a bunch of them. And so the, the ones on the left, you see there, there's a little bit more variance on the ones on the left. The ones on the right are a little bit more tighter. And then in red, we've got the population distribution of preferences for the entire population estimated on the supercomputer. And that's all, what we've done there. All we've done is combined in that special way, all of those gray plots, if you will, right? We've, we've combined the subpopulation distribution of preferences for each of those chunks in a way and we get the red. In summary, I hope you'll agree that the estimate from the supercomputer in red is essentially identical to what you get, which you, what you get from using a regular computer, but taking much, much, much longer. So the stage one looks good with simulated data. How about stage two? Okay, for stage two, if you recall, we're going to estimate the sp very specific preferences for each consumer. Okay, so there's this is kind of a it's probably a new type of plot for for some of you. And um, each of these plots, there's actually a whole bunch of plots in this. Um, each subplot is called a quantile quantile plot. And I won't get into detail in terms of what, the tech, what it means technically, um, but I'll walk through what it means from an interpretation perspective. So we've got three columns of, 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 uh, of plots. We've got the rightmost column, and we have at the bottom of that T equals 45, a middle column at the bottom of that T equals 15, at the, right, at the leftmost, T equals five. The T is just the number of observations or number of transactions that we're observing for any one consumer, okay? So if we start with the leftmost, T equals five. So in the simulated data, we simulated five purchases of let's say shoes. And for that column, left column, we've got five, um, five sets of plots, right? Um, one, two, three, four, five. Each of those represents a random consumer. So we've chosen five random consumers among a million consumers that we've actually estimated. And on the vertical, I'm sorry, on the horizontal axis, we have, so what we're plotting is, we're plotting the preferences, uh, the consumer preferences for each of those four attributes, the attribute one, two, three, and four represented by beta one, beta two, beta three, beta four. Um, the vertical is, the preference for each attribute by the proposed algorithm on the supercomputer. On the horizontal, the estimates of the consumer preferences on the regular computer, single computer. And that's what the red, there, there are a bunch of red dots. Each red dot represents um, uh, where they, uh, the proposed versus the, the, um, the single computer. It's called the Gibbs sampler that we used. Um, and so how close are they? Well, we've superimposed what, what we call a 45 degree line. That's what that black line is. If they're identically the same, those red dots 
should lie on that black line, okay? And you'll see they're not exactly on, but for the most part, they are. And so it demonstrates that the algorithm at the consumer, individual consumer level for these five random consumers, you're reproducing the consumer preferences pretty, pretty closely to what you would normally get on a single regular computer. And when we increase the number of transactions to 15, the middle column, um, we're getting also, also excellent representation. And also on 45, we're getting excellent representation. Although in some cases for when you have 45 observations, there is a slight degradation. Um, that's the weakness of the algorithm. When you have a lot of observations for or transactions for any one consumer, there is a slight degradation, which I'd be happy to talk about uh, perhaps later in the uh, question and answer session for anybody that might be interested. But it works pretty well for the vast number of transactions that most consumers would actually um, uh, go through when in, in purchasing consumer items, for example. Okay, so it works pretty well um, for consumer data. How fast is it? Okay, so in the first uh, row, we're estimating a million consumers. We're estimating the consumer preferences for a million consumers on a regular computer for using a traditional method takes about 13 hours. On a supercomputer with 30 chunks of data or 30 processors, or, um, it takes about 13 minutes and it costs less than $2. That's how much you would pay Amazon Web Services for that time on, on, their, uh, on their supercomputer. If we do it for 10 million consumers, so now we're estimating 10 million preferences, uh, it takes about a week on a regular computer. Um, and takes about 19 minutes on a supercomputer using 300 computers, that will cost you less than $15. And finally, if we do it for 100 million consumers, it'd take about three months to do on a regular computer. If you could do it, you couldn't, uh, but I've estimated it, that that number is an estimate. And on a supercomputer, it takes about 78 minutes, and that's using 1,728 chunks, would cost less than $175. Why did I limit it to 1,728 chunks? Because the supercomputer that I happened to be using um, limited me to that many. It actually has thousands of processors on it, but any one job that I submit, they limit you to 1,700 processors. Um, I could have gone to Amazon and Amazon will sell you um, time on 30,000 processors if you wanted to. Um, so I couldn't have act, I could have actually got done this, completed this much, much more quickly, but I was limited by um, um, the, um, how much the, uh, the, the supercomputer center allowed me to use. Okay, so it's, so it's, so it's about an order of magnitude faster and, and greater, um, depending on how many consumers you've got. Um, this, this, the process, the algorithms actually, at least an order of magnitude and several orders of magnitude, um, as the number of consumers you're estimating increases. So it actually goes, gets fat, better and better the more consumers you're estimating, both in terms of order of magnitude faster and of course, accuracy of the preferences because the more data you've got, the more accurate your preferences are gonna be, preference estimates. Okay, so um, that's the simulated data, seems to work fine. Let's now go to a real case study. And in this case study, we're going to target potential donors. And what do I mean by that? Well, you can imagine in the area of uh, charitable fundraising, think of, think of a large charitable organization where they have a database of literally tens or hundreds of millions of potential donors and they want to offer a campaign and they offer campaigns either weekly or monthly. Among those tens or hundreds of millions of potential donors, who do they target? And so you can imagine that the question of who and how often a potential donor should be solicited for money is gonna be critical to the success of that organization because you wanna get it right, right? You don't wanna blast all 100 million people every week. You're not gonna get very far that way. It's gonna cost you money to do that. Um, so targeting is very important. Targeting, by targeting, I mean doing it very efficiently. So what does the data set consist of? Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, I can't, I don't know the name of the uh, pro nonprofit organization. It was provided to us anonymously, uh, but it is a, US, a leading US nonprofit organization. 
consists of the donation and solicitation histories of over a million donors, which represents 3 million donations, 28 million solicitations for donations over a 15 year period. And on average, um, each donor was solicited about 21 times. Um, so this fits very well uh, with the setting of the algorithm that we've described earlier. Okay, most interestingly, only about 7% currently in this data set, um, meaning the method they've been using, this charitable organization has been using to date, they've only been 7% effective. In other words, 7% of the solicitations they've asked for after the first donation result in actual donations. In other words, they're missing 93% of the time. The need for more, for more efficient targeting is very clear here. And that's what we're gonna to attempt to do with our algorithm. Okay, what's gonna do? We're gonna build a model that we want to estimate, a model of, of consumer preferences, in this case, donor preferences uh, of attributes that are, are good predictors of whether they're likely to donate or not. Um, so the, the, what we wanna predict, we're calling the response variable, is the probability of donating Right, at that particular time, right? when I'm, I'm about to launch a campaign, do I target this donor or not? And I want to base that targeting on the probability, my estimate of their probability of donating. And I'm going to base my probability of donating on four parameters or attributes. One is what I'm going to call the intercept term in the model, which is basically the base propensity for that consumer to donate. And what do we mean base propensity? You know, over the last 15 years, this donor has donated, you know, once every, every year, let's say, or five times. Okay, so there's a base, as opposed to somebody else that's donated 15 times. So the person that donates five would have a lower base propensity to donate compared to somebody that donated 15 times. I'll also look at uh, what I call the recency variable, which is how long has it been since their last donation? I'll look at their frequency, again, to date. How many times have they donated up until now? Um, up until now, what was the average donation amount? And up until now, what was the clumpiness of their donations? What do I mean by clumpiness? Clumpiness is just how lumpy the donations are. And you can imagine that certain donors may binge, if you will. Um, you know, at, at, uh, for a ticker time of the year, they'll donate every week. You know, every week for three weeks, they'll donate and then they'll go dormant. And then six months later, a week, a year later, they'll, they'll, go, they'll, they'll donate a bunch of times again, and then they'll go dormant. So that's a pretty lumpy donor. As opposed to somebody that says, okay, every month, the first Monday of every month, I'm going to donate. Okay, that's a very consistent. That's not very clumpy. Another analogy for those of you that, uh, for example, like Netflix, and the popular show that I like on Netflix is uh, Breaking Bad. It's a, it's a pretty interesting and fun uh, series. And let's assume, you know, Netflix just brought in um, the whole series of this series called Breaking Bad. I get home and I say, oh, wow, you know, Breaking Bad is on Netflix. And um, I decide, okay, I get home and it's a Monday evening and I'm going to binge watch all the, the full first season of, ben, of, 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 of uh, Breaking Bad that Monday, that Monday evening. And then I said, by, and I go to bed at three o'clock in the morning. I regret it because I need to have an early morning. This is wow, I'm not doing that again. And so I, I you know, I'm, I'm done with, with Breaking Bad. A month passes by, and then I get the itch again. And it's a Tuesday evening this time, and I binge through season two. Okay, so that's what we mean by clumpy behavior, right? I'm, I'm kind of watching a lot of this stuff. I'm going dormant, watching a lot of the stuff, as opposed to somebody else that maybe says, okay, I've got this Netflix series. I'm gonna wait till Friday evening and every Friday evening, I'm gonna watch one episode. Okay, that's not clumpiness. Okay. And so what I'll do, I'll look at all of that data in, in using those five attributes. And I'm gonna break up my data into two parts. I'm gonna, the first part is called a training data set, which is really the first 15 solicitations uh, for that for each particular consumer. And the holdout data is all of the solicitations Afterwards, for, so the 16th solicitations and whatever, how many ever there, however many more there are, I'm going to keep those out. I'm going to hold those out from training. 
And so what I mean by that is I'll use the training data to estimate each consumer's very specific preferences and then use the holdout data to predict whether they're gonna donate for each of those remaining solicitations that I didn't use for training. Okay, so that's how we're gonna test our model and, our, and the accuracy of our model. Okay, so here um, is the output of, of the first stage. And I should have mentioned, sorry, I'm gonna go back to the simulated. If you look at the simulated data, the scale, the vertical scale of these plots is, is 0.4. You see, that's the height of the vertical line, 0.4. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty high. Whereas in my simulated data, you'll see the height is about, what is it, 0.01. So the scale is, we're zooming in very, very closely here. And so at first it may seem that the blue and red lines aren't very close. But in fact, because we've zoomed in by a factor of 40, right? 0.4 to 0.01 is a factor of 40. We've zoomed in by a factor of 40. You see these very minor differences. But in fact, if I zoomed out by a factor of 40, it'd be the blue and red line would be on top of each other, right? They'd be essentially uh, the same. And so, um, uh, and so we're actually able to produce the population distribution of preferences very precisely. Um, albeit we're, 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 the magnifying glass we're using here is quite, quite close up. And that's why you're seeing, oh, you know, it's a little bit off. Well, actually it's not. They're actually very, very precise. Okay, that's the population distribution. Um, what, how do the consumer preferences look like? Here, we're looking at a random sample of 24 of these donors. And again, we're plotting quantile, quantile plots, and you've got the 45 degree line, and you'll see uh, um, our, our preferences that we're coming up with are not quite as good as a single computer. In many cases, they're right on, but in some cases, they're a little bit off. So for example, in the quantile plots in the upper right, you'll see for the first two preferences, they're a little bit off. Okay, well, let's see. Okay, so, so the estimates are pretty good. Um, they're very good for many of them, but not as good for others of them. Okay, how does, what is the managerial impact of, of these preference estimates using the proposed algorithm? Okay, so let's go we'll look at that. Why do we care? Why does a business manager or manager of that charitable, charitable organization um, care about this? Um, and before we do that, I should mention, I didn't talk about the performance. How fast is the method? So for a million, just over a million donors, it would take about a, a day and, and uh, six hours uh, to estimate on a regular computer. Um, it takes about one and a half hours on, on a supercomputer and will cost you less than $3. Okay. Okay, so why do you care? Why does a manager care? Okay, so let's go through two types of decisions, decision rules that a manager at this charitable, charitable organization would use to target their donors. One rule could say, okay, now that I've got all these preferences, and in particular, I can predict based on those preferences, the probability of any one donor giving at that particular time, if I was to ask them for money, uh, what is that probability, okay? And if the probability exceeds some threshold, let's say 80%, if I have a donor that has a probability of donating more than 80%, then I'm gonna target them now, okay? That's my decision rule. Another decision rule could be, okay, let's look at all of our donors, okay? Um, you know, all 100 million of them, all 10 million of them, all million of them, whatever it is. And let's just rank order these donors in decreasing order of highest probability, highest likely to donate to least likely. And let's take the top 1,000, okay? And so that could be my targeting rule, okay? And so we'll look at both targeting rules. And for both targeting rules, we'll look at, because we know if they actually donated or not, we could look at the proportion of donation counts that were correctly predicted and the proportion of the total donation amount that was correctly predicted. Um, and that's what this set of plots do. In the, in the upper um, half of the uh, slide, we've got our first decision rule, which is target people based on exceeding some probability threshold. And that's what that horizontal axis is, right? If, you're, um, if, if your probability of donating is above zero, above 20%, above 40%, above 80%, target them. So the threshold is variable. We'll see how the, how the method performs across a whole series of thresholds from zero to 100%. 
And on the left, we have predicting donation counts. And on the right, donation amounts. How many so are we able to predict the total amount that's donated? In uh, blue, we have the performance of the single computer, which takes a super long time. And in red, we have the regular computer. And you'll see they're essentially identical, although you'll actually notice that the supercomputer is actually slightly better. And there's technical reasons for that. Um, it turns out that the supercomputer, not only is it faster, but it actually gets to the answer more quickly. And because of that, you're actually getting more, um, more accurate preferences, and that's why it's, it performs better. On the lower half of the uh, slide, um, you've got the second decision rule where you're going to target people based on the group, the most likely set of donors, right? The most likely 1,000 donors, the most likely 2,000 donors, all the way to the most likely 10,000 donors. And on the left, uh, how many do we predict? How many, what, how many of those donation counts do we predict correctly? On the right, how much donation amount do we, create, do we predict correctly? In blue, the regular computer. In red, the supercomputer. And again, you'll see that they're essentially identical. Although on the upper end of number of most likely donors, you'll see that the supercomputer algorithm is actually a bit more efficient there for the same reason. It's, it's a faster, it converges more quickly. Okay, um, so um, why did I do this? I wanted to demonstrate that in fact, you get this from a managerial perspective, both algorithms get you the right answer, so to speak, right? And the same and, and, and equal value, right? But the signal computer takes too long, right? And we forced it on the signal computer just to show you that yes, the proposed algorithm does work and gives you the same uh, uh, value that a supercomputer does. So we can rest assured that it's doing the right thing, okay? Okay, um, the other point out, the other comment I wanna make is, if you recall, the targeting efficiency that the organization was getting um, without this algorithm was 7%, right? They were missing 93%. And if you look at uh, the lower set, you know, targeting the most likely donors, you're going, 7% is that dashed line, the back dashed line. You can significantly exceed that targeting efficiency to over 90% when you're at 10,000 consumers. So you're almost getting everybody correctly. In other words, very few donors are receiving uh, requests for donations, solicitations that they don't actually uh, uh, positively respond to. So your efficiency is very, very good. Okay, so now let's do this. This is the actual real thing, right? Because in the real world, you're not using a supercomputer, you're using your your regular computer. And with a regular computer, you're typically not able to process um, a million donors or, or 10 million donors or 100 million dollars. What you're actually more typically able to do is use a regular computer to process up to about 10,000 donors in one shot, okay? That's typically what's that. It's actually 10,000 actually generous. And so we've got the same set of four plots, but I've got, there's a lot more detail in this one. Um, and I'll explain what the details are. So in black, so that each of the black lines in all four is uh, what I'm calling the base model. That's basing um, estimates of preferences without using a Bayesian hierarchical model. We're just looking at that, each particular donor's data by itself. We're not sharing data among uh, every, all the other consumers. And so you'll see the performance is not very good on the black. It's a base, and all we're doing is looking at the base propensity to, to donate. We're not looking at recency, frequency, clumpiness. We're not looking at any of that. We're just looking at each individual's base propensity without sharing data. So not very good. We're, um, uh, in the green, we're using, again, individual data. We're not sharing data again, but now we're, we're also using their history. What is their frequency, past frequency, average amount donated, what's the, how, how long has it been since they last donated, how clumpy are they, and you're getting an increase in uh, effectiveness, right, uh, in terms of um, targeting effectiveness, but still not that great. Okay, so let's now go to the Bayesian hierarchical model, so we're sharing data across consumers, and so in blue, we're using a regular computer for 10,000 donors, right, because a regular computer can't handle more than that without having to wait a long time. Um, and you'll see that you're getting a huge increase relative to the models that don't share data, 
right? So the blue lines are much more getting much better targeting efficiency. And finally, we're gonna estimate our model with the proposed algorithm on a supercomputer, and we're gonna run two types of models. One is a, a, a simpler, simpler model, but using all million consumers, so all million consumers, and you're getting a nice bump in uh, targeting efficiency on all four charts. And then we're gonna estimate a, a slightly more uh, rich model, a more fine-tuned model, the, sorry, the, the, the one with the million consumers, the, the um, million consumer about a simple model is in dots, the red dots. Okay. And then we're gonna uh, estimate a, a fourth model um, or a fifth model, I should say, that has a more rich uh, model, meaning it allows for my, more fine grained behaviors and you're gonna get a slightly increase in effectiveness. Okay. How, when you compare the blue and the solid red, meaning the regular computer with a typical size data set and the proposed algorithm on a supercomputer with all of the data set, you're getting a three to 7% increase in managerial outcomes, which represents in dollars per campaign, you're getting between 1.6 and $4.6 million in additional donations that you otherwise would not have gotten had you used a regular computer with 10,000. Um, donors in your data set for estimation. Okay, um, so that's, that's the algorithm. Um, to, to, to take out the, the key uh, conclusions, uh, we proposed an algorithm that runs on a supercomputer that generates the same preferences that you would get using a traditional computer, um, traditional method on a regular computer if you could do it, but you can't. It's at least an order of magnitude faster. Um, and actually several orders of magnitude faster. The more data you have, the more chunks you can use, the, the faster you get. It's actually very easy to implement. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, if you are interested in implementing it, these, the software that I've developed, um, that we have developed is open source. Um, it is available on a common open source platform called GitHub, available to anybody that wants it. Um, we've applied the, the, um, the method uh, to a real case and shown a 3 to 10% increase in managerial outcomes that people care about, which is 1.6 to $4.6 million in additional donations per campaign. So if you're doing a campaign every week, you'd multiply that by 52. If you're doing it every month, you'd multiply that by 12. Okay, that's, that's this algorithm. Maybe we've got a, a minute left or two minutes left. I'll maybe give you a, a, a tease into uh, where I'm going further in, in my research. And um, so this paper I presented today is based on scalable target marketing. So how do you target marketing in a scalable way with big data? Um, this other project, which actually I just submitted to a journal literally two weeks ago, um, is focused on what I call scalable market segmentation. And, and what's the insight behind, or, or the motivation for this, this work? It's based on, really a fact that perhaps many of you and your businesses find, and that is that the top quartile or less of your most profitable customers are, represent, are, are responsible for 150% of your entire company's profits. The bottom fifth, surprisingly perhaps, are responsible for losing 100% of your company's profit. In other words, it's those small, tiny segments of super profitable customers that are generating the bulk of your total revenue or, or profit, I should say. Well, what does that say? That says that, well, if I can identify these very small segments or smaller segments, um, these segments could potentially be very lucrative, but because they're relatively small segments, you need lots and lots of data to identify them because they're small segments. And so you need big data to do that. You need lots and lots and lots of data because you want to be able to find that needle in the haystack, so to speak, right? Um, and that's what the method does. Um, I applied to a case study uh, looking at a fast food restaurant. Um, this is a very large fast food restaurant in the U.S. Who, wanted to, who wants to identify the segments of their loyalty program that is profitable. And you can, if you're anything like me in terms of loyalty programs, Generally, I don't, don't join any loyalty programs, but if I do, I do it only if there's an interest, uh, a bottom line interest for me. For example, 
when I join, I have a, I'm a member of a uh, airline program, loyalty program. And the only reason I join it is because, uh, not because I'm going to fly any more often than I would normally if I had, had I not been part of the program. My uh, flying behavior hasn't changed at all, both pre and post joining the program. But what I do, because I'm collecting points, every you know, fifth flight or whatever it is, I'm able to get a discount on that flight because of the points I've, I've received. In other words, the airline isn't making any money from me, any incremental money. The program is actually dis, uh, is, uh, subsidizing my, uh, my flights. So they're actually losing money. The loyalty program is a loser for me. For, for, for me. However, there, are a, there is a segment of customers that don't behave like me. It's a small segment. And that segment actually loyalty programs does in fact induce greater um, use of, 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 in this case, uh, let's say uh, flying or in the case of uh, my application, uh, purchases of, of uh, restaurant, of uh, sandwiches at this particular fast food restaurant. And being able to identify that segment very precisely allows this organization to better design um, their program for the most profitable members of, of, uh, of the program. Great, that concludes my talk and I'm happy to take any questions if, if you have any. Thank you again for all of your attention. I, I certainly do appreciate it. Thank you, Rico. Now I'd like to open it up for questions. As a reminder, please submit any questions you have into the chat. Um, our first question, question comes from Gretchen and Byrne. Are the models based on a snapshot in time about consumer preferences, or do they also factor in changes in consumer preferences, trends, et cetera, over time? Excellent question. Thank you for sharing for, for that question. Um, so uh, both. Um, uh, so if you recall, I talked about estimating the model in two stages. The first stage estimates the population distribution preferences, and that's the bulk of the work. That's where all of the processing really happens. The second stage is really sub-second, right? It's for any one particular consumer, it takes a sub-second to actually get their preferences. And of course, you can imagine that preferences change over time. And so if preference, well, let, let's do both cases. If preferences don't change over time, you estimate the first stage one time, you're done. And then every time that consumer visits a web particular website, you can figure out what, you know, what message to, to pop up, for example, okay? But if their preferences change over time, you're gonna have to um, update that population of distribution preferences. And that's the reason why you need to be very, very fast because um, you need to re-estimate that first stage every time. And so if it took you months to do that, the preference, by the time you get the answer of those population preferences, the data is old, right? And so, um, uh, and so what you would want to do is you'd want to estimate the first stage on a regular basis, maybe every night, you know, after midnight, whatever, you submit this job to the supercomputer and it estimates those preferences up until, uh, um, you know, that moment in time. And so the next day, all of these messages are now reflecting um, those, those, uh, those updated uh, preferences. So that's one way to do it. That's the brute force way to do it. Another way to do it is you can simply uh, build in uh, a dynamic, um, you, you can build dynamics into your model. Um, and this method will work for that. And what I mean by that is you can assume certain dynamics of, of how people's preferences change and you can pick up those dynamics in the model, in which case you wouldn't have to run the first stage every night, for example, or every week, however often you wanted to. I hope, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Rico. Our next question comes from Andrew. Is, it is easy to see the value of this model for business as well as politics. Where would a business or politician go to access this type of data and analysis to shape messages and predict outcomes? Where would they get the data? Uh, so, so first of all, let me concur with your, um, uh, your conclusion that in fact, yes, there's value, not just in consumer preferences, but in anything you wanna estimate in, in particular, whether a particular voter uh, is leaning one way or the other uh, over time. So absolutely. Um, so I, I can answer the question for marketing. I can't answer the question with politics, but I don't know how 
um, how data is being, if, if data is being sold, for example, when you're doing these polling data, if that's being sold or not. I know in marketing, um, all these large organizations are actually selling data. Now, clearly if you're an Amazon, you're not gonna sell your data or most likely you're not. So in, this, in the case of Amazon, they're collecting all of their data directly, but you can certainly go to Visa or MasterCard or any other aggregator of data and they'll actually sell you the data. So it's fairly, in marketing, it's fairly easy to purchase. Um, there's large marketing uh, research organizations Let's see here, uh, Nielsen is a, is a particular one that's uh, fairly large that uh, is in the business of actually collecting this, this type of data and actually selling it to anybody that wants it. Um, you know, grocery stores, when you go to a grocery store, for example, um, you're providing your, your telephone number or your multi-member program. And so all of that data, transactional data is being stored and being provided to these aggregators from which you can then purchase uh, from and do this kind of analysis. On, on the political data, you know, I'm at a loss because I, I, I'm not in that world. So I don't know how polling data is being, uh, if it's being sold at all or not. So I apologize. Thank you, Rico. We're gonna move into our final two questions before we open it up for networking. Um, our next question comes from Grant. What kind of safeguards can be used to ensure this technology isn't used for nefarious activities, i.e. propaganda? Right, excellent question, excellent. Um, <clears throat> this method doesn't, adreal, doesn't address you know, privacy issues or anything that it assumes that the data that is being collected um, um, is being collected from consumers that allowed for that data to be collected. Um, and so, for example, I don't allow cookies when, um, when I'm browsing for that very reason, because I don't want my data to be collected. And so um, the method doesn't address it. It's assuming the data has been uh, collected based on the consumer's um, uh, agreement. Um, the owner of that data, the collector of that data, there's nothing preventing that, that owner to do as they will with it, including the various activities. Um, so that's the sad uh, part of this. So that's something that we need to spend more time on. It's not part of my uh, focus in my, in my research, uh, unfortunately. Thank you, Rico. As we head into our final question this morning, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us and to Rico for presenting. For anyone interested in networking with fellow attendees or Rico, please stay on the call. Um, and we're gonna hop into our last question. Our last question comes from Greg. If you change your targeting, don't you also change the data now? As in, if you only target the highest frequency donors, don't you now manipulate how often the less frequent donors donate? Absolutely you do, absolutely. And so that's why, um, this is related to that first question I had, that's why you'd wanna uh, rerun the model or allow for dynamics in the model. But let's say you rerun the model because um, you're, you're targeting, right? You're only gonna get uh, donations from people you target. And you're, so you're assuming the, if, you're, if, if in fact your premise is correct, that more frequent donors are more likely to donate, which may not necessarily be the case, but let's assume that that is the case. Um, you're just propagating the initial observation that in fact, the less frequent donors donate less frequently. Um, so what you would do is um, uh, you'd have to rerun the model every time. So you, you, you're, you're targeting whoever you're targeting, let's say the more frequent guys, and they are in fact donating more. Um, you'd have to rerun the model um, to, to control for that. So among, so you'd have separate models, so to speak, or separate aspects of the model that are just looking at the high frequency guys versus, versus the low frequency guys. Eventually the low frequency guys are going to be targeted because, um, a, a particular low frequency guy would donate, you know, after two months. Okay. It's your turn now. Typically you donate every two months. Therefore I need to up I, your time is up. I'm now going to ask you for a donation and, um, and, and therefore uh, hopefully get a positive result. But yes, there's dynamics in the model and you have to uh, rerun the model to allow for that changing dynamic. I hope that was satisfactory. Thank you, Rico. Um, Greg says thank you as well. Um, so 
at this time, um, if you would like to stay on for networking, please do. I'll give those who would not like to stay on a moment to hop off. Otherwise, we are 